Uh, I'm Liz Ryan, for those of you who don't know me, some of you familiar faces. Um, Kalina can't make it today. Oh, <laughs> last few people in. So I'm taking the first lecture and then Professor Kingston Mills is going to talk to you in the second lecture in more detail about T-cell subsets and T-cell cytokines, okay? So we're going to continue on the theme of adaptive immunity. And this is what I'm going to cover today. So we're going to recap a little bit um, on MHC class one and class two antigen processing and presentation. So you covered this last week, but I just want to basically recap on a few points just to make sure that you're clear on it before we go on to the next stage. Okay. Then I'm going to talk to you about dendritic cells, which are an important class of antigen presenting cell and about how these cells um, uh, undergo maturation and their the function of these cells. We're going to talk a little bit about the structure and function of the T-cell receptor and t the T-cell co-receptors CD4 and CD8. And I'm briefly going to introduce a little bit about T-cell development. We're not going to go into that in too much detail because we're going to cover that again in another lecture, but it's just to introduce the concept of how um, CD4 and CD8 T-cells develop. Okay? And then we're going to talk about the interaction between MHC class 1 and class 2 um, cells that express MHC class 1 and class 2, the dendritic cell, with the T cell receptor. And we're going to talk about this interaction. Okay? And then in the second lecture, we're going to look, uh, Kingston's going to describe more about the function of the different subsets of T cells. So that's the structure for today. So again, last week you talked. Right. Um, last week you talked about antigen processing and presentation. So there's dedicated cells known as antigen presenting cells, for example, macrophages, B cells, and dendritic cells. And these cells take up antigen, they process them in a variety of different ways, and they, you end up with peptides that are displayed in MHC class 1 or class 2 molecules on the surface of the cell. Okay, so depending on what the type of pathogen is, it's targeted to either MHC class 1 or class 2. Okay, so cytosolic pathogens, so basically viruses that replicate in the cytosol of a cell, <laughs> are targeted to MHC class 1 molecules, and these class 1 molecules present to CD8 positive T cells. Okay, but cells that um, are taken up by pathogens into into vesicles. For example, they're taken up into endocytic vesicles, are pre processed and presented by MHC class two molecules. And extracellular pathogens and toxins also get processed by MHC class two, and presented to different classes of T cells, which you'll talk, we'll talk about those in more detail later. So just to recap, class one is expressed in only nucleated cells in the body. It identifies the body as self. So it's what um, marks you as an individual, and it's important in graft versus host disease, and, and it's important to get that molecule matched in transplantation. And this is um, detected by cytotoxic T cells, or CD8 positive T cells. Class two is expressed by prof professional antigen presenting cells, processes foreign antigen, and it's detected by helper T cells. Okay? That's just saying the same thing again in a different way. So class one is important in viral infections, identifying tumor cells, and in transplant rejection. Okay? All of these are instances where the antigen is processed by the MHC class one pathway. Class two is more important in bacterial infections, also in viral infections. It processes protein antigens and presents them to the CD4 T cell. Okay. So one of the papers that you covered in your, in your tutorials this week described how they um, characterized the peptides that bound to the MHC uh, class 2 groove. So this is, again, just showing in different individuals, you've got quite a lot of genetic diversity in the MHC class 1 and class 2 regions. And in individuals, MHC will, will bind a different panel of peptides. But basically, this means that... Um, in a population, if there's an epidemic, different individuals in the, pro in the population will see and process and present antigen in a different way, which um, increases the chances of more individuals being able to survive 
in an epidemic. So um, it's important for a population survival in epidemics. Okay, so when I talk about antigen presenting cells, for the most part, this means professional antigen presenting cells, which are dendritic cells, B cells, and macrophages. Now, this is really for your, your own information. This table lists uh, other classes of cells that can also act as antigen presenting cells. So there are many other cell types in the body that also can be, that express MHC class 1 and class 2 or can be induced to express it under certain circumstances. Okay? So this is really for your own information. There's other cell types in the body that can also act as antigen presenting cells. Okay, so I'm going to slow down. That was recapping, so I was just going through that quite quickly. Okay, so I'm going to slow down a little bit now. So I'm going to talk mostly for the next, little, next few slides about dendritic cells. These are a class of professional antigen presenting cells that express high levels of MHC class II molecules. And um, that's a quite nice picture of one there. It's an electron micrograph for DC. Okay. So in the body, you have lots of what are called immature dendritic cells that circulate in the blood and in the tissues. So <coughs> these cells patrol the body looking for invading pathogens, looking for bacteria, viruses, any signs of inflammation or infection. Okay? Um, and once this happens, once the dendritic cell encounters a pathogen, usually these cells, these cells will be triggered by um, toll-like receptors. So dendritic cells express high levels of all the different toll-like receptors, and there's different classes of dendritic cells that express particular groups of the toll receptors. Okay? So there's pretty much one of these cells will identify most pathogens. This causes a whole signaling cascade inside the dendritic cell that causes the cell to change its phenotype and function from a cell that's immature patrolling the t in the tissues to one that will capture antigen, process the antigen, and, and present it, and travel from the tissue to the lymph nodes. And it's in the lymph nodes that um, the dendritic cells interact with the T cells. In to initiate the immune response. So this is basically a diagram of this happening. So you have your immature dendritic cells in the, in the periphery. They express toll-like receptors and a whole array of chemokine receptors that are specific for chemokines that will keep the cells resident in tissues or in the circulation. Okay. Once this cell encounters pathogen, this triggers the toll-like receptor signaling cascade and it causes a, a phenotypic change in the cell. Now the cell upregulates the chemokine receptor CCR7. Okay? The upregulation of this chemokine receptor is extremely important because this allows the cell to respond to a gradient of these ke two chemokines, CCL19 and CCL21. And this gradient um, increases as you go nearer to um, a lymph node or secondary lymphoid tissues. So this causes the homing of this cell that has seen this pathogen to the, um, to the lymph nodes. Okay? Meantime, this cell it keeps changing its phenotype. It upregulates class II molecules. It processes and presents the peptides in the groove of its class II molecules. And it also upregulates what are called co-stimulatory molecules like CD40, CD80, and CD86. So now you have a cell that's taken up, processed, present, um, upregulated the, the, the required molecules to interact with the T cell. And this is then the T cell interaction can happen in the lymph node. Okay, so we're going to talk about this interaction here and what exactly goes on when the T cell and the DC interact. Okay. Uh, yeah. But first of all, in that paper you discussed in the tutorial, there was a little. There was one figure in it that looked at flow cytometry um, plots to assess dendritic cell maturation. So I just want to briefly explain that because some people didn't quite get it. I think. So basically, flow cytometry is a way that you look at the expression of m markers on cells by using fluorescently labeled antibodies specific for the particular marker. For example, here, if you're looking at c the expression of CD40, you'll, you'll incubate the cells with an antibody specific for CD40 
with a fluorescent marker attached. Okay? When you run this sample through the flow cytometer, um, it's exposed to a laser. The laser excites the fluorescence on that antibody and the detector records and picks up that signal and tells you how bright the signal that was, a signal admit was emitted from that particular cell. And it also records the size and stents, uh, it caused, records the scatter, the light scatter pattern in each cell, which is proportional to the size of, of each of the cells, okay? So here you have dendritic cells that have been just grown in medium alone. So basically just the normal cell culture medium, and they express a little bit of CD40. So cells moving up this direction, th they, those, that population there express CD40. Cells here express CD11C, which is a marker that all dendritic cells express, okay? So that's basically showing some dendritic cells express a little bit of CD40. When you add a toll receptor agonist to these cells, you can now see this population has moved upwards. So now this population of cells, all of this, these cells express CD40. So this is what you mean by upregulation of close inventory molecules and how you would look at it ex in an experiment. Okay. So now moving on to going to discuss more in more detail T lymphocytes today. So T lymphocytes are all CD3 positive, and then you have two subsets of well, you've more than two, but you've two main subsets: one subset that's CD4 positive, and one subset that's CD8 positive. Okay, so these are the helper T cells and the killer T cells. And each of these populations then is further subdivided into different functional groups, which we'll talk about later. Okay? So, the T cell receptor interacts with the MHC class 1 or class 2 molecule in th with antigen present in the groove. Okay? So, this is just a diag diagram showing a representation. This is the MHC in green and the T cell receptor up here. And it's just showing that the they interact, and a certain individual will have a whole array of different T-cell receptors, <coughs> and these will recognize certain MHC uh, peptide complexes. Okay, so the basics about T-cell receptor. It's expressed on the surface of T-cells. It's critical for adaptive immunity. You won't get an adaptive immune response without the T-cell receptor present. And it recognizes the antigen and it transmits really important signal information inside the T cell to allow the T cell to proliferate and expand and secrete cytokines and go on to fight the infection. Okay? There are two kinds of T cell receptor. You have what's called an alpha beta receptor and a gamma delta receptor. They're basically two very different kinds of T cell. For the purposes of today, we're going to restrict our talk to the alpha beta. T cell receptor. Okay? This is the most common T cell type of T cell in circulation. Um, the, t the gamma delta T cell is mostly in mucosal at mucosal surfaces. Okay? So this is what a T cell receptor looks like. If you notice it's very similar to the other uh, lymphocyte receptor that we've previously looked at, which is the B cell receptor or the antibody. See here, this is the structure of the antibody that you've covered before with a, a constant region, a variable region, or the, the antigen binding region here um, with heavy chain and light chains. So basically, the T cell receptor is very simi similar structurally to the heavy light chain portion of the FAB of an antibody. Um, and like the B cell receptor, it's coded for rearranging coded for by separate sets of rearranging genes, okay? So the T cell receptor is also co encoded for by VDJ genes that do, um, that uh, undergo um, recombination, so that increases the diversity of the T cell receptor. So basically, the T cell receptor, you've got the alpha chain, the beta chain, the variable and constant region, and a short transmem transmembrane domain and a short cytoplasmic tail. Okay, so that's the structure of the T cell receptor. Um, so basically, it's very s it's similar to the B cell receptor. It's encoded for by VDJ genes that w that um, the diversity is is created by the rearrangement of these genes. 
It's not secreted, the B cell receptor is secreted. It doesn't undergo class switch or somatic hypermutation. The VDJ diverse um, recombination events are sufficient for enough T cell receptors to be generated so that you can really cover a good variety of um, possible epitopes. Okay. And only recognizes antigen in the when it's in presented to it by an MHC molecule. The B cell receptor doesn't need this. It will recognize ant antigen without this extra step. Okay? So this is another um, difference between the two receptors. So, however, the T cell receptor is not, is expressed on the surface of cells as a complex. Um, a homodimer, there's two T cell receptor chains here in red with the V and C regions and the cytoplasmic transmembrane and cytoplasmic tail. And this is, forms a complex with the CD3 molecule. Okay? So CD3 is made up of four chains of amino acids. And these are known as the invariant chains of TCR. In an individual, all your TCR receptor complexes have the same four CD3 chains. That doesn't vary, okay? Um, in, in, in a person. It varies between individuals, but in one person, that will always be the same. Okay? So it forms this complex. You've got, um, so you've got a homodimer and then these CD3 chains all complex together um, and they interact with certain charges in their, <coughs> in the, in the um, extracellular ter portions of the receptor. And what's very important is these, uh, these chains of the CD3 portion of the T cell receptor possess this motif called an ITAM motif, or an immunotyrosine receptor-based activation motif. And this is really important for T cell signaling. And um, once the receptor, when the receptor is ligated from mediating the signal inside the T cell for the T cell to proliferate and secrete cytokines. Okay? So it's basically mo a lot of the signaling actually comes from the CD3 complex in the T cell complex. So as well as having your TCR complex with CD3, at the T cell receptor site, you also need co-receptors, depending on the cell, either CD4 or CD8. And this is the structure of both of these receptors here. And CD4, again, uh, quite a large, both of them have quite large extracellular domains transmembrane, and then um, <coughs> intracellular domain. So, both CD, so CD4 binds to a conserved region on the MHC class II molecule. And when this binding takes place, this transmits signaling to the inside of the T cell. Um, specifically, it causes tyrosine phosphorylation of the kinase LCK. Okay? And this, causes, this is a really important signal to the T cell for its proliferation. And similarly, the CD8 molecule binds to a conserved region in the MHC class I molecule. And this also sends signaling inside the CD8 positive C T cell. So this is what it looks like in a diagram. So you have, this is the T cell. This is the APC. APC expresses MHC molecules. This, in this case, could be either one class one or two with the uh, peptides in its um, antigen binding site. This is uh, recognized by a T cell receptor that's complexed with CD3, okay? This binding event causes signaling in the CD3, so you've got your ITAMs here that, gets f that get activated. In the meantime, the CD4 molecule on the T cell binds to a conserved region on the MHC molecule. If it's CD4, it binds MHC class two. If it's CD8, CD8, it binds MHC class one. And this basically, this binding is really important because it stabilizes this interaction, makes it last longer so signaling events can occur. And it also is important because without this signaling, the T cells won't proliferate and secrete cytokines. So you need all of these components together to interact. If any one of these components is missing, the response won't happen, okay? So we're going to talk a, a little bit later on about the different T-cell subsets. Basically, the CD4 
positive cells are helper cells, CD8 are cytotoxic cells. <coughs> CD4 cells sees the antigen in class 2, CD8 in class 1. They're functionally different cell populations, and we'll talk about that more later. <coughs> okay. So for people who are interested, this is a, re a summary of the signaling pathway downstream of the ligation of the T cell receptor. So when, basically when all of these happen, um, this TCR complex in conjunction with CD4, all of these downstream events happen. But basically, ultimately, the aim of this is to activate um, transcription factor, for example, NFAT, that uh, controls and regulates cytokine secretion. For example, IL-2 gets activated. And this is ultimately what causes the T cell to respond. Okay. Right. So, I'm going to just introduce T cell development. We're not really going to talk about this. This is T cell development in one slide, so it's not very detailed, but it's just enough for you to understand where the different CD4 and CD8 populations come from. Okay. So basically, all the lymphoid progenitors in the body originate in the bone marrow originally. Um, a progenitor, so basically a progenitor then will travel to the thymus, and it's the thymus where T cells differentiate and um, become T cells, essentially. So basically, this early lymphoid progenitor goes through a couple of different stages of differentiation. And these early stages of T-cell development, um, the cells don't express t a T-cell receptor and they don't express c either CD4 or CD8. So they're called double negative cells. Okay? So there's a couple of different um, phenotypically, phenotypically different um, phases of development the cells undergo. After the fourth phase, um, the cells become double positive. That is, at this stage, cells all express TCR and CD4 and CD8, okay? So the TCR that's formed by rearrangement of the VDJ genes, so it can be any number of different TCRs. And this interacts with these cells called cortical epithelial cells. And these cells express high levels of MHC class 1 and class 2 with self-peptides, okay? So these interact with these double positive cells. And the extent of the signaling, the strength of the signaling between these cells determines the fate of these um, progenitors. If they don't get any signaling, the cells just die. If they get too much signaling, the cells die. But if they get the correct amount of signaling, um, the cells go on to develop either into CD8 positive or CD4 positive naive T cells. So basically, if the TCR that... that is that interacts with the cortical epithelial cell. If that, um, is a, that, if that TCR recognizes MHC class 1 restricted antigen, that cell goes on to differentiate into a CD8 positive T cell. If it recognizes an antigen in the pre presented by an MHC class 2, it goes on to become a CD4. Okay? That's very simplified. There's lots and lots of um, things going on there. We'll talk about that in more detail. It's, um, there's a lot of cytokine signaling that goes on in, in the thymus that's very important for T-cell development as well. But basically, the cells that leave the thymus are naive T-cells. They've not yet encountered an antigen. Okay? So they've developed in the, and become either a CD4 or a CD8. They don't respond to... The, the cells that would respond strongly to self-antigen have all been deleted. They shouldn't cause autoimmune reactions. So basically, these naive T cells are home to secondary lymphoid tissues like the lymph node or the spleen. And this is really where the naive T cells live. Okay? And these T cells, the TCRs on the surface of these cells are constantly interact. These T cells are constantly interacting with antigen-presenting cells. And so basically, this uh, one uh, a T cell can see thousands of different antigen-presenting cells a day each with a different MHC and a different peptide on their surface. And if a TCR finds an antigen MHC complex that fits, then what's called the, the primary immune response occurs. Okay? We're going to go once certain conditions are met, so that's what we're going to talk about now.
which will be what initiates the response. So the first step is for the cells to adhere. The T cell and the antigen presenting cell have to stay together in contact for long enough for the signaling in response to happen. So this happens by low affinity interactions between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. So the T cell markers are at this side and these molecules are expressed by the antigen presenting cells at the on the right. Um, so these are high avidity, low affinity interactions, okay? That cause just a delay in the dendritic cell T cell interaction. So this is an this is important to give the T cells time to sample the the peptides presented. If a TCR finds this uh, MHC peptide that fits, there's a good conformational fit. It will change the structure of this LFA1 to make this a more a stronger interac interaction to hold the two cells in the same place for longer. Then the next thing that happens is the T cell receptor um, basically recognizes the antigen in the, in the pre presented by the MHC. So this is basically, this first signal through the TCR is called sig signal one, okay? So this is this interaction here, okay? Okay, but that alone isn't enough for the response to continue and develop. The cell also needs further co-stimulation to get it to proliferate and um, commit to becoming um, an antigen-specific functioning T cell. Okay, so it requires different co-stimulatory signals. And these are also provided to the T cell by the APC. Okay, if it doesn't get these signals, the cell will die. It will just become anergic. It won't respond to any further stimulation. So basically, if this interaction happens, so basic MHC peptide interacting with the TCR, CD4, CD8, but this molecule here expressed by the T cell, CD28, also needs to become ligated by a family of molecules that has in the past been called B7, but B7 is, an is another name for two molecules essentially, CD80 <coughs> and CD86, okay? So the CD28 has to interact with either CD80 or CD86 to get another activation signal. So when you get, in this case here, when you have the B7 interacting with CD28, MHC um, with the TCR and CD4, then you get cytokine secretion and activation of downstream, the downstream sig TCR signaling pathway. Um, so if one signal happens without the other, in both cases, no proliferation occurs, okay? Now, there's a molecule related to CD28 called CTLA4, and if this is express, highly expressed on the T cell and this CTLA4 interacts with B7, that sends a negative signal to the T cell and that also stops T cell proliferation. So there's an, it's, this response is really tightly controlled because it, can be, it is so strong and if it's activated inappropriately can have um, quite bad consequences, okay? So there's a number of layers of control and all of these things need to happen at once for the T cell response to take, take place efficiently. Okay, so this is just a summary then of the series of interactions that need to happen. So basically, you get the first signaling. The first step is basically adhesion of the antigen presenting cell to the T cell. Then you get an the antigen specific interaction between the MHC class one or two molecule with the TCR, the C CD3 complex. And you have the co-receptor CD8 or CD4 interacting with the constant region of the MHC molecule. Then you get co-stimulation, so you get the CD28 expressed by the T cell interacting with CD80 or CD86 expressed by the APC. Then if all of these things happen, then you get cytokine secretion, you get activation of transcription factors like NFAT that secrete IL-2, and then this is the last signal that, that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Okay? Okay, 
So the same dendritic cell needs to provide signal 1 and signal 2 to a particular T cell. Okay? If this doesn't happen, um, the T see if the s if a T cell gets signal one but gets signal two from someplace else, the um, another dendritic cell might be activated and contain a different antigen. You don't want cross reactivity to happen, so it's just another layer of specificity to stop to um, to stop autoimmune responses occurring. So, but I've actually gone through this really quickly. <laughs> pretty much finished now. So basically the dendritic, dendritic cell T cell interaction happens in the lymph node and there's a number of different interactions that take place in what's called the immunological synapse and all of these interactions need to occur for the T cell to receive the correct signals for it to become activated. Okay. So <laughs> just thought this is probably a good time to recap on the different stages from the different lectures that we've, you've had so far to kind of put the train of events together. So the first lectures you learned all about the innate immune response and you learned about toll-like receptor signaling. So this is the point in which the body recognizes there's a, um, been an injury, there's a pathogen, something, something's wrong. So these are the danger signals sent into the body. This causes basically an inflammation or cytokine, cy pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion. And this, in turn, causes an influx of cells to the site of infection. This includes antigen-presenting cells, for example, dendritic cells or macrophages, that pr up take up the antigen, process it into antigenic peptides, and present it on their MHC class one or two molecules. These cells then mature. They travel up to the lymph nodes. And in the lymph nodes, they find the, the naive T cells that have come from the thymus. Okay. These cells then interact, and if you get the antigen, correct antigen in the correct MHC molecule that interacts with a uh, T cell receptor that recognizes it in the presence of all the required co stimulatory signals, then you can have proliferating T cells <coughs> and you get functioning T cell um, populations. Okay. So I just included a few definitions at the end in some uh, websites. But if anyone has any questions, we can either break now or you can ask some, qu some questions. Okay. Can I ask a question just about the uh, factors that were A, B, C, which you mentioned a little bit earlier? Does yeah. the mechanism of class two uh, junction there, is it similar to the actual mechanism that occur in normal A, B, Cs? Or yeah. There is. I'm sure it's slightly different in some s in different cell types, but there's the MHC class two, for example. There's a number of transcription factors, like one called class two transactivator or CT something something. Yeah. Um, that regulates the expression of MHC class two molecules. So if this gets activated, for example, interferon gamma can upregulate. I can activate this this transcription factor that causes the upregulation of class of the class two molecules. It's mostly sort of inflammatory signals cause the upregulation of these molecules. Okay. There's enough cells in the thymus for this, but the double negative they express in the tree. They express what's called the pre-TCR, TCR. so it's, it's slightly different to CD3, but the, um, the, the, there's a whole panel of markers for those cells I haven't gone into. <laughs> you need to do, like a, a, say, a, a six or seven color fax analysis with expression of CD44 and CD25 and all these different markers, and CD62L, to really identify, you can identify each of those developmental pathways, they all express. Each of those, each of them express a different characteristic cell surface, or, you know, marker yeah, expression. So you can pull them out. It's the same with B cells. B cells in the bone marrow, all there's a number of different developmental stages, and they each express an array of receptors that that you can determine which developmental stage they're at. So that's a lot of that work and what controls. Um, 
Where is that gone? What controls the transition between each of these stages is, um, you know, still quite an active area of research. It's not quite been entirely figured out yet. Um, yes. Yeah, so at yeah, at this at this point, they don't ex at the early stages they don't express a TCR. Um, it's they're undergoing rearrangement during these trans uh, you know during this transition. So it's during this transition and at this stage when they upregulate the TCR, the rearrangement the rearrangement has occurred. So they all express a different TCR. Whatever, whatever happens in their particular so genes. So they are specific to something at that point. At this point, they and are. If they, interact, if they interact strongly with, you know, with the cells, with self antigen, then, then they're deleted. Um, There's a few different rounds of selection to make sure that these, po these populations don't survive. And how do they, the ones get out that are going to be circulated? What, what Again, that? it's. Um, they express different ligands on their cell surface. And um, for, for example, L-selectin causes um, naive T-cells home to secondary lymphoid organs. And there's a chemokine gradient and chemokine receptors that they all express, you know, highly unique set of receptors on their cell surfaces. Okay, so you can have a break, I think. And um, Kingston will be here at five o'clock. We talk to you about.